Hi, everyone. So that indeed is the title of my talk. Um, we're just trying to get the controls. Is it working? Cool. So we're going to go through a few things. Mostly, I'm just going to get into a talk about me, because that's important. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about firmware. That was weird. A um, little bit about vulnerabilities and a little bit about hashing. Yeah, I'm very sorry if you're familiar with all of these topics really, really well, um, but I figured not everyone would be. Yeah. So, cool. I'm Brent. Um, I work in a kind of research and development role. Um, I'm mostly, I was going to say I like to play with stuff and I like to break stuff and I like to fix stuff. But I feel like none of those things really ever happen. I kind of poke at things and then sometimes find interesting things. I'm not particularly good at these things. Yeah? So please don't think I'm the expert in all of these topics. Yeah? This is what I've found along the way and a lot of stuff that I think is generally interesting. Yeah. So the first thing, what is firmware? I thought we should ask Google because Google knows everything. Can you read that? Because that thing shakes a lot. Yeah, permanent software programmed into read-only memory. Yeah. For, the, for the most part, I figured for all of you, firmware might be associated with something like a router. Yeah. This is where, at least for most people, I feel like they first encounter the term firmware. They either have to perform a firmware update or something along those lines, or like most people, they never perform a firmware update, and they read about it in the news a while later after all their accounts have been hacked or something along those lines. Um, now, firmware is not exactly something I would call maybe sexy. Yeah, it's not something that appeals to many people. Um, I don't know too many people that just go home and like research firmware a lot. Yeah? The Google trend shows this. Um, over time, people seem to be less and less interested in firmware or at least less and less interested in typing it into Google. Um, Unfortunately, Google Trends is not a great way to tell people's interest. It really only tells how many people typed a word into their search bar. But I think this says a lot about the current state of things. People are less and less engaged with what they're actually doing on their routers and their devices. They're not looking up how to install these things. They're not looking up how to use firmware and what it is. Yeah? Typing it less and less into the search bar because a lot of the stuff either just doesn't get done Always done for you if you're really lucky. So, for the most part, to simplify firmware, I'm just going to say we need it to make our devices work. Yeah? Because for our purposes and the purposes in this talk, that's all we really need to know. The other thing is that generally it is supplied by the manufacturer. Unlike an operating system which you might choose to install, most firmwares you don't get a choice. The manufacturer is going to supply something to you and that's that. Sometimes the manufacturer is nice. And uh, sometimes they actually supply updates. But for the most part, the manufacturer is actually the problem here. Uh, they are mostly useless. I'm generalizing here. If you are a firmware manufacturer, please don't hate me. Um, most manufacturers are useless. Somewhere along the line, they generally forget that they made a product and just stop supporting it, um, mostly because they like to sell new stuff. And I'm sure you've probably all encountered this before. Um, how many people here, just out of interest, have actually updated their router firmware? It's like amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's probably the only room I can ask that question and get that many hands up. Um, but let's be honest, uh, how, many of you, how many of you updated your router firmware this year? Cool. We're down to like half. <laughs> yeah. Now, of those half, that didn't put your hands up but did the previous time, was that because there's no firmware available? All those who didn't have firmware available? Okay, not that many. That's sad. But please go update your router firmware if you care. <laughs> um, but basically, this is a general problem. We have to update these things. Luckily, they might get done for you. Yeah. Now, in some cases, when you go to update your router firmware, you get a change log. Yeah? A change log basically is just going to tell you what changed in that version of the firmware. In this version, provided by TP-Link, they were very, very, very great. They just said first firmware. Yeah. Um, I feel like 
that maybe they've their firmware repo is based on Git or something, and they just replaced the word, replaced the word commit with firmware, because um, it felt better to just have something in there. Um, thought it was a bit of a strange thing, because I didn't think they'd need to state it was their first firmware. As we move on, this is the same product line, by the way. I just picked one at random and took three firmware updates in a row to kind of show you what I found to be the general trend of how these things go. Yeah. This is our first update, okay? The first one is the first firmware. This is our first update. Improved stability. Very little after that. There is no description. That's all we get, okay? More info would be nice. They didn't say what they actually improved other than the stability. Um, they did not allude to fixing any bugs, okay? Now, often this happens if they weren't called out on a bug, they simply don't talk about it. They fix it and they move on. They say it's more stable. Then we got into something a little bit better. Finally, this is looking like something we could actually use. Yeah? Got quite a lot of info there. Now, what's quite interesting, you might have noticed and asked yourself, these lines here, fixed some bugs and fixed some vulnerabilities and fixed a bug that some function will not take effort effect after restore the configuration file. It doesn't even make sense. Um, Unfortunately, for the most part, change logs are useless. Yeah. Be really great if they told us everything we need to know. Very seldom, well, at least in my experience, uh, they don't often even tell you which vulnerability they fixed. Yeah? You have to go do the reverse search, go to CVE, type in your device, and hope you find it there. Yeah? That's kind of counterintuitive. If you're installing something, at least if I'm installing something, I'd like to know what they've done and what's actually inside. So, how do we know? When we install something new, how do we know what they changed? Well, we could install it and literally see what changed. Yeah? Unless you're like, you know, updating Android or something, you're probably not going to notice big changes when you do an install. Yeah? Most routers, they're going to fix a bug and you'll never see it. Yeah? It was a bug that you probably never encountered because you never went to that settings page. Yeah. The other option, hash the file and see if it's actually different. Yeah? I mean, if they've released a firmware update, it should be different, right? Yeah? I've actually found a firmware update once before where I do not believe they did anything. The hash was the same as the previous version. They'd incremented the version number. Yeah? Now, I do agree that this is probably an anomaly and definitely not the way to tell whether your firmware works. Yeah? For the most part, whenever you get a new version of firmware, it's just going to hash to a different hash. Of the three firmware versions that we looked at the change logs for, when you hash them, it comes out something like that. Is everyone here more or less familiar with an MD5 hash? Is there anyone here that really wants me to go through it? Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> yeah. Now, for those that really wanted it, here's a little slide. They can review it on the video. Yeah. But the most important part is that MD5 hashes are reduction, okay? They reduce your input down to a set output, okay? It's a set fixed output limit in terms of characters, okay? As a quick example, if I input the word cake, yeah, and I hash that, and I input the word cakes, you can see we get two completely different hashes. Yeah, I only changed one letter, in fact, I added one letter, but you agree that, at least to me, those hashes do not look the same. Yeah. If you do see the similarity in those, I suggest you write a paper. Um, what we do have, though, is something called fuzzy hashes. Yeah. Fuzzy ha hashes are context-triggered piecewise hashes. Yeah. These are hashes specifically designed to, instead of be completely different when hashing small changes, to actually be more similar. Yeah. Most of you might have come across this in the form of something like SSDeep way of performing a similarity hash to see files that are similar but different. Yeah. Now, a lot of these sim hash or fuzzy hashing systems have a way to compare hashes. So even though the hashes are different, you can compare them and get a percentage similarity. Yeah. My experience, that's not always great. Yeah. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. I took the good old block of text lorem ipsum 
and I hashed it. Yeah, you can see it there at the top. Um, that's great, it just gave me a hash. We've really got nothing to go on. The top one here is the SSD for lorem ipsum. Yeah, just the first paragraph. Then I simply took lorem ipsum and put cake at the end. Literally the word cake at the end. And the only thing that changed in how SSD, if you have a look, is the last character. Yeah. Now, that seems fair. Yeah, we changed one word and we got a one character change. Everyone agree? Ah, I thought that was fair. Small change, small change on the hash. Now that's great because it means we can take blocks of text that are similar, compare them, and get something different out. Yeah? We get slightly different hashes out, but they're comparable. Now, instead if I put cake at the beginning, we start to see something slightly different. Yeah? We don't just get a change at the beginning. My lines have moved, I'm not sure how. Um, anyway. Ooh, imagine the purple line slightly closer to the text. Yeah, so you can see at the start and then about halfway through our hash, we've got changes. Yeah. Now, this is because the way the context hashing works, changes at the beginning make quite a, have quite a large effect on how the hash changes. Okay. For this reason, uh, something like SSD is not great for hashing a lot of things. Yeah. Specifically, things like pictures, if you wanted to tell if two pictures were similar, it is going to do nothing for you for the most part. Yeah? Especially if you're using compressed pictures, because obviously on compressed data, it's going to be even worse. But on good old plain text files, works quite well. Yeah? Now, similarity hashes, unlike cryptographic hashes, should not be used for storing passwords. If you would like to use them for storing passwords, I hope the only reason you're doing so is to prove some kind of bizarre point. Um, they do work well on text files and code. Now when I say code, I mean source code. Yeah? Something important, they do not work too well on compiled data. Yeah? They can, but as many of you may expect, when you compile something and it gets optimized, the change may be m quite a lot larger than you might expect. Yeah. Now this, in terms of the hash itself, means that you can get completely different hashes with a very small change in source code, but due to the way it was compiled, a very different outcome in terms of the hash. Yeah. That's just something to think about when you're wanting to use these tools if you want to compare things. Yeah. So, as we've said, just simply hashing the firmware, not a great way to compare it. Yeah. Instead, what we can do is we can take our firmware and hash the actual files that make it up. Yeah. Now, a great way to do that is to simply pick a device, download its firmware, have a look at the um, change log, and go ahead and pull it apart. Now, what I did, just to kind of show this, I picked something that I actually happen to own so that I can actually test it, downloaded it, took the firmware, Pulled it apart. Wow, that went way over to the right. Yeah, and what I did, simply did a diff between all the hashes that didn't match. Yeah, simply t I took all the cryptographic hashes of files and folders. If they matched perfectly from one firmware to the next, I removed them. Yeah, I took those as unchanged. Then took the SSDs and fetched all of the files that are associated with them. These are all the files that were added, yeah, that are newly added to the firmware. Now, in the change log, it actually mentions that um, they added functionality for deblocking the pin automatically. So it's possible that's what we're seeing. Not gonna lie, I did not investigate exactly what all those changes were. I mostly just wanted to see that it kind of works, that you can see what's actually come in you can now take this and go verify whether this is something you actually want on your router. Yeah, before you actually go and install anything, you can make sure that all of these things make sense. On top of that, you can go and make sure that there's no bugs within them yourself, if you're you know, that inclined. Yeah. Now the next thing is what I call firmware evolution. Most manufacturers are pretty lazy. They reuse devices, they reuse boards, and they use almost like the equivalent of code Lego blocks when they build these routers and a lot of networking equipment. 
They use very simple bases and they simply add on the features that they require to sell that product. Yeah. And for this reason, a lot of devices track back to the exact same base firmware image. Yeah. And when you start hashing up these firmwares and comparing them, removing what changes between them, you very quickly see what remains the same. You can very quickly see the kind of <laughs> the, the beginning of where these firmwares came from. And you can see how they gain in complexity as either the price of the equipment or scale, size, port count, and so on increase. Yeah. Now, there's not a lot you can do with this information. It is mostly just interesting. Um, but I think it's really cool to look at what's changing and look at what doesn't. Yeah. Now, sorry, just not sure the slide's supposed to be here. <laughs> oh, cool. So, it's a little off, but it's fun. <laughs> so, in terms of how much something has changed, once you've found out that you've got a whole bunch of files that actually have changed from one firmware version to another, it is good to look and see how much they've changed. SSD and fuzzy hashing allows us to do this. Yeah, if we've got an SSD hash, we can compare them between our two firmwares, two files that are different, but at least, let's say, have the same name. Yeah. If we're talking about things that are getting renamed, it pushes up the complexity a little bit, but we can still use our SSD and look for files that are over a certain percentage of similarity. Yeah. Like I said, this pushes the complexity up a lot because then we're literally comparing every file to every other file. Um, that's great if you're only doing two firmwares. When you're wanting to check the entire D-Link DRR family, that becomes quite a large problem very, very quickly. Yeah. So, can we verify change logs? Yes, we can. We can at least go through things and see what changed. Is it perfect? Not at all. Yeah. But we can at least build tools to get us a lot closer. And, I mean, this was a very quick pass over how we might get there. But I think you can all at least take some of this information, maybe use it in going forward and verifying what you install before you're going to do so. Yeah. And when all else fails, it's always good to just get more data. Go pull more change logs, go pull more firmwares, and start comparing all of them. Now, if any of you were here because you wanted to hear about vulnerabilities, uh, that's still coming. So, vulnerabilities, obviously, you've all prob hopefully come across this. <laughs> um, information on vulnerabilities can be found largely through CVE. Yeah. Now, a lot of people believe CVE is kind of the be-all and end-all of vulnerabilities. For the most part, it is simply a naming convention. Yeah? It allows us to give a unique name to a vulnerability and a description that everyone agrees on, something that describes that vulnerability and ties it to a name. There's an example of one. That's all it is. If we actually want to go a little bit further, we can look at something like NIST's NVD. The National Vulnerability Database takes CVEs and then actually ties and links those CVEs to products, to vendors, and to weaknesses. So they've actually got a list of known weaknesses and known, known vulnerabilities, not known CVEs, but known vulnerabilities themselves, and they actually put all of, the, all of this in a database so that you can search through it. I say you can search through it, it's not really fun. They've not built a very good system if you want to just go dive through it. But it is all there, and you can download it all. So that's quite nice. So if we have a look at what, we, what we've got, this is the number of uh, CVEs listed per year. As you can see, there was a sudden increase. Now, I did not look into why this increase happened. Um, there was a, I would have said, a fairly decent trend upwards, and then a lot of vulnerabilities in a very short period of time. Okay. Now, purely looking at this data, my assumption would have been that it would have had to do with the speculative execution problems experienced on a lot of processes. The timing seems about right-ish. Um, but some interesting stuff. We can see big increases. If we then go and just show how much from each of those years, how many vulnerabilities were actually linked to firmware, that's what you can see in red. Yeah. Now, 
Sure, we're not talking half. We're not talking like half the vulnerabilities. But I mean, how many of you own more than one router? Yeah? Oh, this, thanks for being a few people to put up their hands. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, keeping it interesting. Yeah? How many of you own more than one laptop or cell phone? Yeah, a lot more. Yeah. So you wouldn't expect routers and firmware to be a huge chunk. But they make up a surprisingly large number of vulnerabilities. And it's something that we all buy, put in a room, in a cupboard or something, and then literally forget about. Yeah, most people, maybe not us, but a lot of people, yeah, we have to talk about the general public here as well. Yeah, a lot of people put these things down and never touch them again. So to see any large red bars there is bad. Yeah? So if we explore that a little bit more, thanks to NVD, we can actually go and tie some CVEs down to products. NVD is quite cool. When you pull the data, you can actually go and link the CVEs through to products that actually were affected by those CVEs. And here we can see there are some CVEs that are affecting the 600 different products. Yeah, that's quite bad. <laughs> yeah. Now, obviously, that on its own is kind of useless. This is the main one. Okay, was a vulnerability that affected Yamaha devices. Notice, router firmware. Now, personally, I've never encountered a Yamaha router, <laughs> but apparently this was bad. Um, <laughs> apparently it affected a lot of Yamaha routers and a lot of different, um, in this case, there'd be different SKUs of the router, different firmwares that were involved. Yeah, not 600 routers, <laughs> 600 versions of that router. Yeah. So that's quite bad. If we look at the next one, it's a little, you know, maybe a bit more common than Yamaha routers. Yeah. But here we've got a kernel bug. Here we've got drivers. This is linked to Dell. But as you can see, there are a lot of big manufacturers that are affected. Yeah. And manufacturers that are, you know, as the previous talk said, you know, a well-known brand you would expect more security from. Yeah. These are not unknown brands. This is a list of some of the most affected brands by number of vulnerabilities that affected them. Yeah? If we look once again, uh, I don't know what Yamaha did wrong, but <laughs> wow. Um, I mean, Cisco has fewer vulnerabilities than Yamaha. <laughs> so, but as you can see, these are some big names. D-Link, Cisco, yeah? uh, HP, Intel. Not small names. These are not small, funny little companies. These are big companies. Sure, they probably release a lot more products, which means they're much more prone to just, add, in a numbers game, having a vulnerability found within their product. But it's something to think of. At least when you're buying a router, you could need, you know, go on to, go on to NVD, go find the least useless router and buy that. Um, don't go on to take a lot and just pick the one that's best selling. <laughs> yeah, chances are it's one of those right at the top with tons of vulnerabilities in it. Yeah. So, what if we want to go a bit further? What if we want to look at unpublished vulnerabilities? Yeah. Now, this is obviously a bit of an odd area because for the most part, you either find vulnerabilities, you know, you're a bug hunter, you're doing bug bounties, or you know, you're making sure your products don't have a vulnerability in them. But there's a weird in-between that we can actually play with, and that is the fact that we've got all this information about previous vulnerabilities, and for the most part, most manufacturers don't stop you downloading their firmware. Yeah? So we can go and we can start looking for vulnerabilities. Now, to do this, what I did is I just downloaded a lot of firmware, yeah? like about 1.8 terabytes of compressed firmware, um, which unsurprisingly, when you uncompressed it, was a lot more. Um, <laughs> it, it got bigger. Um, <laughs> that's fun. I also hadn't quite thought through the complexity when I started this project. Um, I very quickly limited it to only D-Link so that I wouldn't die. Um, but what I did, I took all of this and started building up a database of hashes. Yeah? Much in the same way that I spoke about using it to check change logs, I went and hashed the firmware, the actual binary itself, yeah, recorded 
what type of packing it's used, whether it was squash FS, all of that information. Then took every file after I unpacked it and hashed every file in every folder using both MD5s and PSWAS hashes. Yeah. This gave me, I won't lie, a, a bit of a big database. Yeah. But it meant that I could very quickly search for things that were similar. So I could go through, pick a product that I knew was vulnerable, and start investigating it. Uh, NVD was great for this. I can go pick a vulnerability, and it will tell me all about it. In this case, we've got an authentication bypass. And it tells me all the information I need to know. The vuln has something to do with you know, category underscore view and folder underscore view. The nice thing, when you've got a f massive database of firmwares, their files, and their hashes, you can simply go look up that look up that file, look up its hash, and see where else it was used. Find every other firmware that made use of that exact file. Yeah. According to NVD, there were 10 affected firmwares. Yeah. I found more than 37 other affected firmwares making use of the same file. Yeah. Now, whether all of these firmwares have the exact same authentication bypass, I can't test. Unfortunately, virtualizing firmware is a uh, fun but tricky on its own. Yeah? The only way to really test this properly in a real-world situation is to literally go buy all those routers. Yeah? This was supposed to be fun, not expensive. Um, it's my version of fun, but um, <laughs> I, I wasn't quite willing to go buy that many different routers. So unfortunately, I couldn't test everything. I could only test one router, and it did have the same bypass. Yeah? And that just happened to be because I managed to find somebody that had one. Yeah. Now, obviously, 37 firmware images, it's a, it's a large number, but something to remember here is there are a lot of funny variants, especially TP-Link and D-Link. They'll sometimes release an Africa version, an EU version, and a US version of the same firmware. Yeah. So saying 37 might be blowing this up a little bit, but that's still a, n a bunch of different firmwares that weren't covered in the CVE or NVD listing. Yeah, so these are things that people aren't looking out for. If you're watching the CVEs, you know, you're very good on your security, you watch the CVEs and you make sure your stuff is secure, they would never have posted this. Yeah, because it's a variant of the firmware that maybe wasn't heavily adopted, possibly. They fixed it in a future update. A lot of these were old firmwares. The change logs don't state that they fixed the bug. Yeah, they just might have brought out a new firmware. But the fact that it's an unlisted bug means people might not notice it and might just slip by. Yeah. Do we just go back to the same page? Cool. <laughs> so is this great? Not really. Yeah. When I say not really, this is a lot of processing. Okay. We <laughs> have to do a ton of searching. I try to automate this. Uh, it's one of those things where you think, I've got this database, I can now just tell it to go find a firmware go find a vulnerability, find the file, return me every router that's affected, and repeat. That's a lot. Um, it is a very, very large search area. So unfortunately, this is much more of an exploratory project. Yeah? As much as I would like to release a tool that I could just put online, and it would run, and it would automatically update the CVE listings and fix all the firmware versions that were left out, that's just not going to happen yet. When someone gives me a nice big server, that might change. Yeah? I was working on a GUI that would help visualize all of this, showing how firmwares evolve from one to the other. I'm very sorry that I couldn't get that done by this talk. I think it would have been very nice for you to see what files don't change, what files do change, and which kind of base format of the firmware moves from product to product. Okay, especially with brands like D-Link and TP-Link. They've got these massive product arrays and very, very small little variants of products. Very often, the base of their firmware is quite similar. Yeah. The next thing, fuzzy, uh, fuzzy hash searching is slow. Yeah. So for instance, if you do find a vulnerability, that same vulnerability might exist in another file, but due to a tweak in the file or a slight difference in what is required by that firmware, you might not get an MD5 hash match. Yeah. Simply due to any number of reasons, the interface, different colors, different regions, 
all kinds of things. What would be really nice is if we could use fuzzy hashes to look for things with a 90% match yeah? and expand our net and go and find vulnerabilities that were even less likely to be found on their own. Unfortunately, that becomes an, just a simply unrealistic problem. So in summary, we can find changes, we can follow firmware evolution, and we can follow the reuse that these manufacturers are doing. Yeah? We can even possibly look up uh, products that had a bad run, so a bad line of products, and make sure that the next product you or your company are buying isn't based on what is inherently a bad product or an unsupported product. Yeah, you can do this on your own as well. I mean, you can simply look and see how often they change the product. If they refresh it every year and stop releasing firmware, it's a bad product. <laughs> yeah. But I think most of all, the ability to start getting into finding these unlisted vulnerabilities gives us quite a platform to go and explore and at least improve upon things, get rid of some problems that weren't fixed by the manufacturers. Yeah. So thank you for listening. I hope that was interesting for everyone. Uh, yeah, any questions? Cool, so you want to know when I was going through all the files, when I was taking the firmware and going through it, whether I was hashing just the internal of the file or the byte stream. So I was actually hashing the byte stream. Now, that was mostly because I was using it as a running digest for the entire directory. So as I was going through files in the directory, I was building up a hash of the directory itself as well. But I was using the whole file. Cool, so just to repeat that as much as I can. <laughs> so basically saying, can I not do both? Okay. Hash you know, the inside and the whole file to kind of try and capture as much data as possible. Now, yes, I, I can in future, that's a good thing to do. Um, literally, it just means more data. <laughs> when I started this, I was actually doing everything with SHA-256 um, just because I was uh, playing around with different things, seeing what I could do. Uh, and then realized that all I was doing was wasting a stupid amount of space. Yeah. Now, obviously, that doesn't change much, but definitely there are a lot of things you can do with changing how the files are hashed. Uh, I think that one went up first. Yeah, um, so the question was, uh, any tools, uh, rec tool recommendations to extract firmware besides binwalk? The besides binwalk kind of closes the question. Um, for the most part, it's binwalk. Um, you can use uh, the firmware manipulation kit, uh, FMK. Uh, it is not too bad. Um, on that note, though, something to keep in mind if anybody wants to extract firmware and recompile it, something I did come across while I was playing with this, you can totally take firmware, extract it, and recompile it. But something that sometimes happens, people don't follow the spec. Yeah? SquashFS is actually a spec. There's a way it's supposed to be implemented. I came across multiple instances of firmware that don't actually use the correct standard for SquashFS. So they mess with it. Binwalk will happily extract them. Yeah? But if you try to put them back together, they won't work. So if you are planning on messing with things, just be very careful because FMK will claim that it managed to put it back together um, and you very possibly might break your hardware. But uh, FMK, Binwalk, top recommendations. Do you have any? <laughs> okay. So the Git repo, uh, sorry, to repeat, he uh, asked whether um, using hashes and then treating it much more like a, 
using tools similar to how you would analyze a Git repo, um, if I could use that in a visualization, did that cover it? Cool. So the Git repo thing was actually something I looked into right in the beginning, because I thought that network graph of how things change over time and how people commit, I thought might be something to look into. Um, and for the f whole firmware itself, it's very good for showing when firmwares change. But what I found is it was very hard to represent how the firmware itself changed. Just it could only mostly show that it had changed. There's a lot that you can do with Git though, um, by almost building the same database of your file trees in Git. Uh, you can actually get quite a lot out of it. So I think it's something totally worth exploring. <laughs>